Hey guys, it's Kelly. Who do you want to spend election night with watching the returns come in with? I think you want to spend it with your favorite Midwestern moms who've spoken to over 150 candidates covering all 50 states. That's right, we're having a live show on election night. More details coming soon. Welcome back to Two Broads Talking Politics. As usual, I am one of your hosts, Sophie, and I'm here with your other host, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Sophie. Tonight is Kylie Overson. She is the Democratic candidate for the North Dakota Tax Commissioner. Welcome, Kylie. Hello. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for joining us. Can you start off by just sort of introducing yourself to our listeners? Who are you and how did you sort of come to be running for our North Dakota Tax Commissioner? Sure. So, again, my name is Kylie Overson. I am a former state legislator out of North Dakota. I represented the 42nd District in Grand Forks for four years and currently work as an attorney in Fargo representing primarily clients with disabilities and doing some work in the juvenile court system as well. I came to the Office of Tax Commissioner and came to this campaign um, out of frustration of what I saw as irresponsible tax policy that led our state to a really poor budget situation. We've been cutting agency budgets across the board for the last approximately three years in the state, and that's really impacting our ability to fund programs and services that are important, whether it's education or human services or infrastructure. And I just continually was frustrated with those policies and our tax commissioner's lack of leadership on those issues. And so I made the decision to step up and run for this office and have really, really enjoyed the opportunity to travel the state and talk to voters about whatever it is that's on their mind and, and kind of bring a, a different perspective and a, a, a real opportunity for voters to see two different candidates for this office. And can you tell us a little bit about the office? What does the tax commissioner do? Sure. So in North Dakota, the tax commissioner, it's largely an administrative office. You know, there's not many states that have an elected tax commissioner specifically, but it's, you know, the person responsible for overseeing, broadly speaking, the collection and distribution of tax revenue across the state. Um, They're also responsible for overseeing all of the local tax assessors. So um, county commissioners, for example, County auditors, those who are working at a local local government level to assess and collect taxes. There's also some responsibility to or authority to build and craft agreements with other state governments to work with tribal governments in the state. So it's and there's of course the excuse me the prosecutorial powers of the tax commissioner to go after those in the states that aren't doing their their duty and paying their taxes. And so it's, like I said, largely administrative. But my campaign, we've, we've talked a lot about what I see as an, a larger role for the tax commissioner, and that's you know, being an advocate for good policy. Because it is an elected official, um, you do have a platform to speak to not only people across the state, but also to the governor and the legislature and to use the, the expertise you have in your office to make sure that the legislature is passing responsible, fair tax policy that serves the long-term interests of the state. So North Dakota has a a fairly small population, especially compared Mm -hmm. to the size, geographic size of the state. What are the the kinds of sort of tax revenue that the state brings in right now. Uh, so I recently, we had an episode about Wyoming, and they were talking about most of the mm-hmm. taxes that fund state government coming from oil and coal. So what are what are the kinds of things uh, that are sort of the major sources of tax revenue in North Dakota? Sure. So, you know, our, our economy is, is largely a commodity-based economy. So we're looking at oil and coal, natural gas, um, other types of energy, and then agriculture. Those are the two biggest sectors in our economy, and that also, you know, impacts our sales tax and, of course, income tax, both corporate and individual. And so that's created a lot of, I'll say, instability in our state budget because we do rely so heavily on commodities. And so there's always changes and fluctuations in the market that we can't control for. 
And so I think one of the, the best things that any of our elected officials can do is, is just to really push to diversify our economy and look at other other economic engines that we can bring into the state or to strengthen those that are here to make sure that we're not so reliant on markets that we ha- we can't control. We also have, um, for example, a growing aerospace unmanned aerial systems sector growing in the eastern side of the state. And we're you know, a unique state with a lot of prairie. And so programs like that really have a a good landscape to to take off. And so there are some unique things that we can be looking at to strengthen and diversify the economy. And I think that that's going to be an important conversation at the next biennium. You said as you're going around, uh, it's been you know interesting talking to people around the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think this is interesting, a, a statewide election, but one that probably doesn't often get a ton of attention. So what are what are the kinds of things that, that people are telling you? What are the things that are on their minds? Sure. So, I mean, you're right. This isn't the tax commissioner's race is definitely not the first thing people are thinking about <laughs> during an election cycle. Sadly, I think there are a lot of voters who don't even know that we have a tax commissioner. They probably don't know who the current tax commissioner is. And so that's always the first you know, starting place in the conversation is talking about the importance of this office, the importance of that person in that position, and then, you know, broadly talking about tax policy. But when I've been talking to folks across the state about tax policy, the conversation almost always reverts back to the state budget. Um, And right now we're at a place where we aren't funding things like mental and behavioral health at levels that we need to. Um, North Dakota has seen one of the highest percentage increases in suicide rates, and we need to have real hard conversations about what we do to invest in programs that prevent and reduce suicide. And it's hard to do that when we don't have the necessary funding to do so. And so, um, and that does come back to tax policy for me. And, you know, we're in a state where we, we cut many different types of taxes for many years while increasing the spending and didn't really have a conversation about how that basic math was going to work out. And so trying to relay that message to people when I'm traveling and talking about Whatever it is that's important to them, whether it is mental health or education or infrastructure, um, that we talk about why having strong tax policy to support those programs is important. So you're a younger candidate, and I know that when you were elected, you were when you were first elected, you were one of the youngest legislators in the country. Can you talk yep. a little bit about sort of the importance of having young people in government? Absolutely. That's that's been one of the most fun parts of running this campaign and, and you know, the other involvement that I've had in politics over the last um, eight years or so is, is bringing a younger, new perspective to the table. I think it is so important that we have young people in the conversation um, and different diversity of, of all kinds, whether that's age or gender experience. You know, we, we've got to have different voices at the table because everybody's impacted uniquely by the decisions that government makes. And so when I first ran for office, I was 23 years old, um, wasn't out of college um, until August of the election year. And for me, it was important that we had young people, um, students' voices, working you know, young families at the table because the decisions that we make in government, whatever it is, are going to have long-term impacts on those young people's lives. Um, we're thinking 20, 30, 40 years down the road, um, how we're funding education now and how we're taking care of our communities now uniquely impacts those young people. And their voices are really important so we know what kind of state they want to live in. So we keep them here and keep them involved. And it's also, you know, getting young people involved, I think, is is equal, you know, not just running for office, but also getting them active, working on campaigns, um, having conversations about issues that are important to them. Um, I think that generations before me have done some things wrong, and we've got a lot of messes to clean up, particularly nationally. And so passing off leadership to a new generation, I think, is is going to be incredibly important in making sure that they're well-equipped, that they're educated, that they have the tools that they need to take take on the societal problems that we're facing is, is going to be a big challenge. Um, but I think it's, it's a really important challenge to take on. On your website, one of the issues that you talk about is efficiency, transparency, and integrity in government. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. 
having spent my fair share of time trying to do my own taxes and look at my own <laughs> property taxes and things like that, I know that um, uh, transparency and efficiency are not always high on the list of <laughs> taxes, right. tax commissions. So what are the kinds of things that you see that could be done to, to make that process more efficient and transparent? Sure. So one, I guess one example, and this is the conversation I had just today with a, a man who used to serve on the tribal council for one of North Dakota's tribal nations. And he handed me a piece of paper that showed all of the revenue that's produced from that specific reservation in taxes that is provided to the state. And he said, but I can't find this anywhere on the website. I have to go to the tax commissioner's office. I have to make a specific request for this information and it should be available publicly. Um, and that's a small part of it. But making sure that any information that the public wants can be accessible online. And there are, you know, a lot of ways that we can do that. There's advanced technology that, that we ought to be implementing it in all of our government agencies. Yeah, but the other big part of that that I've seen more and learned more about while I've been on this campaign um, is just the simple act of getting our tax commissioner and other elected officials out into communities across the state more often, getting them out of the the power of the capital, engaging with taxpayers, engaging with local government leaders, engaging with tribal governments, more than just during a campaign and during an election cycle. Because I think there's a lot of anxiety around different tax issues, whether it's property taxes or income taxes or anything else. A lot of that anxiety can be resolved with with simple conversations and, and having the openness to answer questions and and explain to people you know what you're paying in taxes and where those tax dollars go. So having more open forums and community town halls where anybody can come and have a conversation with the tax commissioner, making that as accessible as possible has been a priority of mine during the campaign and, and would continue to be if I were fortunate enough to be elected. I know that a couple of years ago you were featured in Living Lutheran, which is the publication of the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, uh -huh. as one of their 10 under 40 leading the church and changing the world. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little yeah. bit about your faith and sort of how that drives you to run for public office. Sure. Sure. So during my time, particularly when I was in college and um, in law school, I was really involved with my campus church in Grand Forks, Christus Rex, and really became passionate about issues of justice through a lens of faith and and seeing the world through that perspective. Um, and so for me, I, I I don't think that religion plays a role in government, but I think that faith and spirituality and your worldview obviously shapes how you make decisions and how you set your priorities in governance or in life. And, um, you know, the way that that's played out for me has been working on women's rights and human rights. And I'm working for LGBT um, freedoms and protections in the state, uh, working to take care of children and families. Those are issues that I see as issues of justice and that my faith has informed. And so I, you know, those are kind of guiding principles for me. And it's also been, you know, a place to connect across North Dakota. North Dakota is one of those, you know, Midwest states where we've got a lot of Lutherans and Catholics. And, you know, that's, we find some common ground on those issues. Um, no matter what part of the political spectrum that we fall on, there's some conversations to be had about how we convene around issues that we care about within the faith community. So North Dakota is a, a pretty Republican place on paper. Uh, a lot of the elected representatives within North Dakota are Republican, uh, with the exception, mm -hmm. of course, of the current U.S. Senator, Heidi Heitkamp, who is running for re-election right now. But what what are you sort of seeing on the ground? Do you think that that people are looking that closely at party affiliation? Uh, you know, sort of what do you see as your, your path to victory in this race? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not naive at all to the reality that I'm in running as a Democrat in the state. Um, but I, you know, prior to taking on this challenge at the statewide race, I was the chair of Democratic Party for the state. And so, and of course, in the legislature, learned the importance of having a strong minority party that brings a different perspective and a different voice to the table and that balances, balances government. 
And so on the ground, what I see, I think, right now this year is that people are tired of division. They are tired of government not working for the people. That frustration is not limited to one party or the other. And so I think that there are people who are willing to consider and um, look at other candidates that they maybe wouldn't vote for because they, they want a the government that works again and that works at all levels. And so the conversations I've had with people, you know, I made some phone calls to undecided voters across the state and the you know, almost verbatim, the conversation was, well, I'm, I'm a Republican or I typically vote Republican, but I really appreciate that you called me and you're willing to have a conversation. And so I'll consider voting for you. Um, and in a state like North Dakota, those are real conversations that happen frequently um, with, because it is a small population and you end up knowing a lot of people that you interact with when you travel. Those one-on-one face-to-face connections are super important to voters. And so that's been a big focus is trying to get out and meet people and interact with them so they see that you're not <laughs> some scary liberal, but you're their neighbor. You're someone that they go to church with and that they work with and go to school with um, and that you have a lot of the same values that they do. We might just fix problems in a different manner. Are there more Democrats running statewide in North Dakota this year? Yes, but not, I mean, there's, there's only been a one or two years when we haven't had a full slate of candidates. So um, there are more in the sense that we have a full, strong slate of Democrats running. Um, but if I can digress a little bit, actually what's been more exciting for me is that we have more women running for office in North Dakota than we've ever had. 58% of, for the Democratic Party, 58% of our legislative candidates are female. Um, I don't know the numbers on the Republican side, but I know that they have a significant number of women running. And then we have three women running for statewide offices. And I worked really hard on, on recruitment goals and, and trying to get more women engaged. And so that's been a very exciting part of this campaign. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll see more women elected into the legislature this year. In your campaign photos, there's uh, lots of young energy as well. Lots of uh, younger people, younger supporters. Are are you yeah. sensing that that that's something that's happening around uh, around North Dakota this year? That there are more young people interested in politics than in voting. No, I think so. I think because of the national political scene over the last two years, that young people have been paying more attention, and my hope is that. That attention turns into engagement and votes. You know, we have a lot of young people who are running for office, a lot of young people who are working on campaigns. And so I'm, I've seen more. I hope that it, it actually results in more young people showing up at the ballot box, because that's really, of course, when it matters. And, you know, anecdotally, I think right now we have we have recreational marijuana on the ballot in North Dakota, and there's a lot of speculation that that will turn out a lot more younger voters and that's yet to be seen, but I suspect that that speculation is probably accurate. That's on the ballot in a lot of places this year. <laughs> yeah. I, and well, and it's, ballot measures in North Dakota are kind of a, an unpredictable phenomenon. I'm, and I'm grateful that we have initiated measures and that the you know, citizens can put their voices and values into, <laughs> into policy in that, in that way. But it, it definitely changes the dynamics of, of who is showed, showing up to vote on election day. If our listeners would like to help out your campaign in these final weeks, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So they can find more information on my website, which is just KylieOberson.com or find me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All right. Excellent. We'll put a link up on our website as well. So Kylie, thanks so much uh, for speaking with us. This is this is really great. And uh, I love your North Dakota accent. So <laughs> that's super fun <laughs> as <you>. well. <laughs> so I appreciate the time and the invitation. We have with us today Diane Hinman, who is running for the North Dakota House of Representatives in District 13. Hi, Diane. Hi. So could you start by telling us just a a little bit about yourself and your background and why you decided to run for the North Dakota House this year? I was brought up on a farm in northern Towner County in North Dakota. My father was a legislator. 
in the late 50s, early 60s. He was in the House of Representatives in North Dakota. He was an eighth grade graduate, farmed all his life. And when I got to the point in my life of retired, I thought, okay, now is my time to run for the same thing he did. Our legislature has been very partisan the last 20 years, and I am a Democrat, and I think it's time for some change to balance out our government so we don't have bullying on one side. Uh, I think I would like to come to the conclusion that we should have a state with equal partners and work towards the middle for the future of all our constituents. So District 13, this is near, somewhat near Fargo. Can you tell us a little bit about what the district looks like? Okay, my district is in West Fargo, which is borderline with Fargo. We are from Interstate 94 north to a little bit north of our main avenue. We border on Fargo. It's been Republican for many, many years, and some of them have served for 24 years, and we think it's time for a little bit of change. I'm 69 years old, and nobody has spoke up to run that's younger. So I thought, <laughs> this is an opportune time <laughs> for me <laughs> to run. So, yeah, it's uh, quite a challenge, but I am enjoying it tremendously. Both sides of the aisle. I mean, I have met so many nice people on both sides of the aisle. And I think we've all come to the conclusion that we want what's best for our state. Working together. So I understand that you recently attended a candidate's forum. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience, like what that was like for you? We had a a forum here about three weeks ago on a Wednesday evening in town. Unfortunately, a couple of our um, opponents could not be there. They had mm-hmm. meetings in Bismarck. The middle of August was when these forms were scheduled, and therefore we think on our side that they should have probably come forward and said, we're busy that night, whatever. We had a forum. Um, people sat in the audience and asked us questions as to education, whatever subject they were most interested in, and we got to tell them a little bit about how we feel about um, property taxes, um, what's going on in the legislature by lowering the oil tax uh, rates, and how it's affected our state in these areas of education, human resources, and the like. And what are the the kinds of things that you think the, the voters in District 13 are really concerned with right now? I think they were, are concerned about their property taxes. We are a growing, growing part of Fargo, and we've had to do a lot of infrastructure, build schools. In fact, there was a bond issue that was just voted on to build another high school. That would be the third high school that we have. Uh, I think Cheyenne High School came into being south of us, south I-94, and probably six years ago, five or six years ago, and now we have to build another new high school to accommodate the students moving into our area. So that's one of the main things, I believe. We um, also have a program going on in West Fargo. It's called 2.0. And this is what the city, and the city beautifying the downtown area, making it more accessible for Everyone putting in park systems, just aesthetically making it more nice for the people moving into here. We had a forum with our governor here about three weeks ago in the city, and we had four kids from um, Cheyenne High School and four kids from West Fargo High School on the panel. And... Of course, there's nothing to do in West Fargo if you're not in sports and if you're not doing certain things. And one of the questions asked was, well, what do you do for entertainment? And they said, oh, we have to go to Fargo for all our entertainment. 
if we build a theater in West Fargo, they would stay in West Fargo. They would, you know, whatever. So we're looking at those kinds of things that are good for our students and to keep them in our own area and whatever else. And I think uh, that's a good thing. What is the energy like in your district in North Dakota, particularly among Democrats? Are people excited that you're running? Or are you getting a good reception? I am getting a very good reception. In <laughs> Great. Fact, I'm amazed with young people. The young people are out knocking on doors every day in our district and, and doing things. And, and they are building up my reputation as a person, I guess. And, uh, Everybody looks at me and they says, well, why did you ever want to run when you've got free time now to do what you want to do? And I said, I said, I think running is important. I said, if I win or if I lose, I said, at least I tried it. I did it. I want to represent everyone. I am very much a supporter of the LGBTQ community. I am for new Americans. I just want what's right for our country and not so um, divisive as it has become. North Dakota right now is sort of overwhelmingly Republican in the state house. And so there's a, a probably fairly likely chance that if you're elected, the Democrats will still be in the minority. What do you think is sort of the, the key to sort of working together, working across the aisle and, and making sure that, you know, there's actual uh, bipartisan legislation that, that you're able to, to get through some of the things that you would like to have happen? Right now we have a measure on our state that is a ethics commission measure, mm -hmm. which will put a lot of emphasis on reporting what you have, um, not being bought out by outside interests. I believe some of the, a lot of our people in our state belong to the outside interests, such as ALEC and organizations of that to try and influence the legislature into voting for things that have nothing to do with North Dakota. We have had, the one in my district has has introduced legislation for being against Sharia law. And my goodness, I mean, that's just a wasting taxpayer money as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. We have to be unified that where we want this state to go, where our education needs are with, uh, from pre-K through higher education, I would say that's one of my priorities, um, making sure our seniors are well-equipped with what they need by increasing Medicaid pay payments for uh, to make our rural hospitals still sustainable. Many people can't get to the big hospitals in the state. Therefore, we need to make sure that there are a lot, and I think everybody is that way. I, I, I just have this feeling that I think the tide is turning in this state and people are willing to compromise and do what's best for our constituents. As far as West Fargo goes, I think we have nursing homes, we have this, we have that, but I think education is still number one. Uh, property taxes, um, some say, oh, it's getting too high and whatever, but if we want good roads, good uh, streets, good services in our, our district, I do believe uh, we have to pay for that. I mean, it's got to, the money has to come from somewhere, and I think as long as you're a good steward of, of um, the money and whatever, I think it can be handled properly. Diana, is, is there anything else that you want to make sure that we talk about? Well, they've turned down bills in, in North Dakota as far as LGBTQ and making sure their rights are known when they move into apartments and things like that. And they can't be thrown out because of their gender and whatever else. And they voted that down, and I would like to see that go through. We have a Sunday law, which um, everybody opens up at noon, and we're losing a lot of services over to Moorhead. And I do believe North Dakota has to come to the conclusion that 
we can shop anytime. If we would go to church on, on Sunday morning, that is our choice. But if somebody doesn't want to go to church and they want to go shopping at six o'clock in the morning, whatever it may be, whatever they need, the services, plumbing, whatever, I uh, think we need to make sure that's in place also. Yeah, I was surprised. It wasn't until I was looking at a map right before starting to plan for this episode that I realized that Moorhead, Minnesota is right across the border (laughs) from Fargo. (laughs) Yeah, there's a big distinction there, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota's a very progressive state, and, and uh, uh, North Dakota is not, and uh, we're going to try and change that with this election. <laughs> Great. If our listeners would like to help out your campaign in these final couple weeks, how can they do that? My name is Diane Heinemann, D-I-A-N-N-E. H-Y-N-D-M-A-N, and you can donate to Friends of Diane at Post Office Box 758, West Fargo, North Dakota, 58078. Excellent. And these districts, uh, because North Dakota is fairly sparsely populated, it doesn't look like you need that many votes to to win. So uh, any little... uh, door knocking, any little anything could could really make a big difference in a district like this. Exactly. Yeah. Just getting out there and make yourself known and, and, uh, uh, you know, hearing what the other people have to say and whatever. I must say, while I've been door knocking, people on both sides of the aisle have been just uh, nice. And I think that's what people are looking for these days is nice. <laughs> Yeah, I'm loving all these stories of uh, how canvassing is going, and it's really, I think, restoring some faith in uh, the country right now. I think so. I think we have to be positive. This is just a tide that's turned, and and we've gotten away from from being together, and I think uh, people are looking for being together again, working for our country as a whole. All right. Well, Diane, thank you so much for joining us today, and, and thanks for running this year. Well, thank you very much. This is very interesting. (laughs) And uh, you two take care. Okay, great. You too. too. Okay. We have with us today Tim Hoy, who is running for the North Dakota House of Representatives in District 45. Hi, Tim. Hello. So, Tim, could you start out? Just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run for the House of Representatives this year. I'm 37 years old, um, originally from North Dakota here. I decided to run this year because, for me, it's kind of, you know, our, our I feel like our politics are kind of getting a little bit too partisan and I wasn't raised that way. I don't feel like my role models were Ken Conrad and Byron Dorgan. Uh, When I was growing up in high school, uh, they were pretty influential to me. And I remember I've talked to them both and they had both told me that, you know, uh, things that they did to get things accomplished for North Dakota and for the country, you know, granted I'm only running for state legislator, but, what they did, you know, is they worked across the aisle on both, uh, both sides, um, the Democrats and Republicans, to get things accomplished for you know, the good of the, the constituents. So for me, that's the reason, a big reason why I got into election this year, because I just feel like uh, both federally, even in, even statewide here, um, especially in my district here, it's just two one party. We're trying to do everything, you know, by the one party, and and, and to be frank, our North Dakota is a very super majority. Uh, there's 96, 98 people roughly in our state legislature for the House, and there is about 80 percent of them are GOP. So when they can go and pass any bill that they want without any opposition from the other side, but they're not working to better the, their constituents. You know, that's just my feeling. So that's the reason why I entered this race. I come from a tech background. Um, I'm a small business owner here in North Dakota. And like I said, I, I work in the tech field. I have about 20 years 
doing anywhere from help desk technicians all the way up to um, where I'm a computer programmer. So, you know, I've worked my way up from, you know, doing the smallest type of IT all the way up to being a developer. So that, that's kind of me in a nutshell, and that's the reason why I'm running for office this year. And can you tell us a little bit about the 45th District, sort of where is it located and, and what's it like? Sure. So District 45 is in Cass County, North Dakota, which is uh, Fargo, so the largest city on the east side of North Dakota. My district is part of North Fargo, and then we also, and we have a lot of rural area. So it stretches all the way um, north of town to a couple of small towns called Gardner and Targetville. And then we go west of there to a town called Harwood. And then south, I live in, actually with, in West Fargo. And it's, I live in a part of West Fargo that's the only part of District 45. So West Fargo is not a very big part of District 45, but there is some. So we have a pretty, you know, one of the top five or six largest um, districts uh, because it's so, you know, there's so many uh, small towns. We also have NDSU, which is North Dakota State University, which is the largest campus in the state, is also resides right on in District 45 as well. So it sure seems like if any district in North Dakota were going to be a little bit democratic that, you know, this might be one of the the districts that would have some inroads toward that. But the two current representatives are both Republicans. What are you sort of sensing on the ground as you you talk to people? Do you think people are sort of thinking along partisan lines this year? Are people open to voting for whoever can do the best job? What are you sort of hearing? Sure. So, you know, District 45 is, it's a mixture of both because we have well, you know, a lot of inner city, I wouldn't say inner city, but we have a lot of city because Fargo is the largest city in North Dakota. You know, um, and District 45, I would say half of our, maybe even more than half of our district resides in Fargo. So, you know, when I've, I've been out door knocking and talking to people over the phone, um, you know, there a lot of people are fed up with the way politics are. I mean, it's hard. People don't follow state politics as much as they should. You know, when they talk about federal issues, um, they don't like how the, our our elected members in Congress are. Everything is one one party, one party, one party. There, there's you know, there's not a lot of people who you know hear about working across the aisles to get things accomplished. You know, and I and I tell people, you know, the biggest thing I suggest is, you know, people especially here in North Dakota in, in District 45, you know, they should get in more involved in their state representatives because we you know, control things like the budget and we control things like infrastructure, property taxes. So there's a lot of things that, you know, the federal government doesn't do that. Um, They should, you know, these are things that are affecting them every day uh, on their day-to-day basis. So um, as far as, you know, how, you know, people go on the doors and everything, um, to me, I've, I've, I've had a lot of people, a lot of Republicans even, tell me that, you know, they're, they're sick of that and they're going to vote for somebody like me who's more of a, like a moderate type person where I want to do what's best for, you know, my constituents and I want to do what's good for North Dakota. Um, I'm not here to represent just the Democrats. I'm, you know, I'm endorsed by the Democrats, you know, I socially, I lean left, but I'm also, you know, if, I, if I'm elected, I'm going to be representing Republicans, independents. So we have to do a good job for everybody. And the best way to do that is by reaching, you know, across the aisle to work with both sides um, to get things done for North Dakota and for District 45. So as far as, you know, a blue wave, you know, if we want to call it that, it's kind of hard to say right now. Um, I, I feel that the, the, the shift is, it is shifting towards me being more of a purple district instead of a pure red district because our current state senator and our two um, representatives are all the GOP. You know, hopefully we can flip all three seats, but I think we're going to be able to flip at least one, if not two seats. Um, but we'll see. I mean, you know, the polls are in a couple of weeks, so the election's in a couple of weeks, but we'll see. I mean, it really varies on who gets out. If we get some people from NDSU and go out and vote, we could easily flip all three seats. But we'll see. I mean, it's we still got 18 days until the election, and, you know, I'm going to get out and knock on more doors and talk to more people, and, you know, hopefully they're not so fed up with um, the federal and they, and they can 
learn from, you know, learn their representatives and find out more about me. You alluded to this, but I just want to make sure listeners understand. So in District 45, there are two seats that are held uh, and there are four people running. So two Democrats, two Republicans. And is it just the top two vote getters on election day that end up then getting those seats? Yep. So for the first, so we have three current incumbents, one state senator, um, and then there's two representatives. And then so each three spots, there's two, one state senator from the GOP who is the incumbent, and then there's one Democrat senator. And then for the representatives, there's four of us running, two Democrats, two Republicans, and both of them, the Republicans are the incumbents right now. And yes, the top two vote getters do for the for the representatives do earn the spot to go to uh, Bismarck, our, our capital, and become a legislator. It seems to me like there's a lot of young people running in North Dakota. You mentioned that you're 36, and then we had just talked to Kylie Overson, who I believe is only 29. She's running for tax commissioner. Uh, and there's a couple of other millennials running for North Dakota State House of Representatives this year as well. Can you talk a little bit about the energy in North Dakota and maybe why there's so many young people running? Sure. Well, let me just make sure uh, I'm 37. Um, oh, and I am sorry. 37. <laughs> no problem. No, no problem. And I'll say this: I am the old person out of the three Democrats running. Um, <laughs> we have one of my running mates. He is 21. And uh, our state senator candidate is, can't remember if she's 30 or 31. She just had a birthday. So I don't exactly remember if she turned 30 or 31. So yes, I'm the old man of the group at 37. And yes, Kylie is 20, 29. Our Secretary of State candidate, um, Josh, is 36 years old. Max Schneider is, I think he's 38, 39. He's running for Congress. And yes, we have a lot of local candidates running for the legislator who are, you know, under under 40. We have some under under 30 as well. You know, I don't know the reason why, but, you know, the I would say um, a lot of people are just set up after, you know, two years ago from the election and want to take a stance and, you know, they want to do something good. You know, that's the reason, part of the reason why I got into this is because, you know, I thought that it was a good time to get into politics and, you know, I want to do something. I want to leave North Dakota a little bit better. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a veteran, you know, but this is my way of repaying, you know, my country and my state. If I were to win, you know, I can help shape policy that will help the gen- our generation you know, my generation, because, you know, I'm a, I am only 37 years old, and I have a lot of years left. You know, our current incumbents, a lot of them are, one of the, one guy told me at the door a few weeks ago, he goes, you know, I went to the last session in 2017, because our sessions only go every two years, and our last one was 2017, and he was up at the grandstands and looking out, and he said, he told me, he was like, and I quote, there's a lot of old white haired bald people. <laughs> so so when you when you get that from people who are you know, they're not, and he wasn't even a politician. He was just he went out there to visit and see our policy you know, our lawmakers in action and you know, he, there's nobody like like me. So I full set of hair and um, you know, I'm not white, but not gray and of that. So that's I think that's the reason what kind of sparked a lot of, you know, younger you know, younger people. There's a lot of people younger than me. I just think that's a big reason. You know, people have. You know, everybody our generation. It's our turn to come, step up to the plate. So mm-hmm. we're. That, you know, a lot of us are starting to do that. That's the reason why I, I. I feel why a lot of us are joining. You know, running for this election. So it looks like you just mentioned that the the session only goes every other year. And it it looks like this is sort of a, not a volunteer position, but not a highly compensated position either. What does that look like then? Do you, you'll continue working more or less full time at your current position? Do you, do people try to sort of hold other jobs at the same time? What does that end up looking like? So when we're in session, we go for 80 days. That's on our state, co- our state constitution says we have to be you know, 80, 80 days every biennial. So a lot of people don't. I mean, if I were to win this election, I live in Fargo, our state capital, where I live in West Fargo, which is, you know, next to Fargo. 
but our state capital is in Bismarck, which is three hours away. We're there Monday through Friday. A lot of people don't work during the session. So it, you know, it starts in January and usually ends, you know, first part of May, end of April. So really we only have 80 days to be in session. I think, you know, there's, there's some, there's some potential legislation that might break it up to be, you know, 40, 40 or 50, 30, you know, 50 days, one year, 30 days, the next year, there's some potential legislation that's going to be introduced this next um, session to maybe do that where we, instead of having to meet just once every two years, we can meet once a year. But as far as working goes, no, you know, I don't know of any politi- you know, any lawmaker who actually works while they're still doing it, just because talking to a lot of, you know, current incumbents, um, they, you know, they get up at seven o'clock in the morning or, you know, they're in at their, their chairs or um, committee meetings by, you know, seven thirty eight o'clock every day. And then after hours, they're, you know, reading bills. So I wouldn't want to put the pressure trying to commit to a full-time, another job because, you know, I'm elected, you know, to do this job. You know, I'm not there to try to work and, you know, get 40 hours at my current job. I'm there to do, you know, shape policy and shape budgets. You know, those things to me are more important than my fourth full-time job when I'm, you know, in in session. So that is, that is my job. So then do people have uh, jobs that are, are flexible enough that they can do them when they're not in session? You know, I just, I, I wonder about sometimes with these legislatures that are not well compensated, you know, how people sort of, if that limits the kinds of people who can run for office, uh, you know, you, you got to have either a very flexible job or, you know, be independently wealthy or have a spouse who works or, you know, those sorts of yeah. things. Well, as that gentleman told me, there's a lot of uh, old, you know, white haired uh, <laughs> people on the floor. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, retired people, a lot of independent, you know, business people who can take time away from their job. We also have a lot of real estate um, agents who, you know, kind of make up their own hours and you know, uh, selling houses. So they can maybe do that when they come home on weekends if they if they chose to do that, you know. Personally, you know, I have a regular nine to five job. I'm not a, you know, well, I'm not an independent, you know, independent wealthy person. I have a small business that I do when I'm not campaigning, but I also have a nine to five job. So for me, you know, my work, you know, I've talked to my boss and he's, he's like, yep, if, if you win, you know, we'll let you, you know, just take a, take an absence while you're gone or, you know, during session. Cause it's only for a couple months, you know, every two years. So, I mean, it's not a lot of time that you're, you're away from your job. But I know a lot of people who do have these nine to five jobs. I'm sure I shouldn't say I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people have nine to five jobs, but I don't know what their individual, like, you know, work load is with their boss or with their companies and if, if their companies are being flexible. But I know personally, my company is being flexible to allow me to take time off so I can, you know, do what the people, you know, District 45 Hopefully, we'll elect me to do. He did say that. Well, you know, if you win, great. If you don't win, great, because we get to keep you. So, I, mean. <laughs> I was pleased to see on your website that one of the issues you address is net neutrality. I was wondering if you could mm-hmm. talk a little bit about your position on that. So, I'm a very strong um, supporter of net neutrality. The biggest thing I, I feel that we need to do is to protect, and not just protect net neutrality, but also I want to, you know, I talk about encompass with. Um, online safety, but with net, net neutrality, because as a small business owner, you know, I, I work out of my house when I'm doing this, when I'm working at my small business, I don't want to, ha- I don't want to see myself have to pay a lot of money to have a, you know, access to like emails or, you know, the, like a PlayStation network or streaming internet, you know, for Netflix and Hulu, because there's a lot of people who do that kind of stuff nowadays. It's very, very um, big, especially with college students, you know, who they who stream everything on um, Netflix or Hulu or play games, you know, Fortnite taking over the world, apparently. So for me, it's, you know, it's a huge, huge issue because I don't want to see people have to, you know, pay more in their internet bill for something that's already been promise to them and or you know even in like north dakota we don't have net neutrality other states are trying to 
get their own net neutrality, or they've had governors who have, you know, signed an executive order to, you know, enact net neutrality rules for their state. Our governor is, you know, is Doug Burgum, who was a founder of Great Plains Software, who comes from Microsoft, and another gentleman who is running in District 41, one of our um, highest, hottest contests in North Dakota, because it would unseat our minor, or our majority uh, leader, who's been in office for 30 something years. But anyways, he and I are very big, you know, supporters of net neutrality. And so, I mean, he's a small business owner as well. And, you know, we, he has clients outside of the state. I have clients that I've worked with outside of the state. If we have to have, you know, a Skype meeting, even with, with you guys, you know, who's to stop the, you know, our ISP or anybody from being able to say, well, you're on Skype where you're going to have to either pay for more, you're going to have to pay to have this, this type of streaming service or B, we're going to raise your money so you can have, or so you can have, you know, a different, excuse me, not a uh, different service, but um, raise your, have a different package, you know, on top of your base package already. So you have to so you can do this type of services like that. And that's, you know, that's, going to hurt small businesses because, you know, when they're already t- money is tight coming in because they're not Microsoft, we rely on our clients to, you know, all over the country. And if we have to talk to, you know, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where you guys are located, but if we're, you know, on a Skype call, you know, if my internet was, you know, if my ISP was doing something with, you know, so I had to pay more money and I couldn't afford it, as a business owner, then I wouldn't be able to talk to you guys and I wouldn't be able to make money for my business. So I, to me, you know, it's just, it's a huge thing. We have to keep net neutrality because of, you know, those issues. And here's a, a good example. Mexico with AT&T already has, AT&T says here that they're not going to do anything right now, blah, blah, blah. But in Mexico, they're already talking, they're already enacted, you know, against net neutrality. Um, they have five different tiers of service. The first two tiers, you don't have unlimited data, um, and you can't use like Facebook or Uber or Lyft. Now, if you want to use those apps, you have to pay more money. And if you want to have the fifth tier, which is basically unlimited with everything, no matter what, or the other day, like tier three and tier four, which would be like you can use up to a certain amount of data, you know, and then going up to the fifth one would be unlimited. So they block you from being able to use, you know, Rideshow now, Facebook, things like that, which you know, I don't, you know, Uber's getting pretty big even here in Fargo. Lyft is pretty big. I, you know, I've driven for Lyft and Uber. So I'm, before I was doing the politics thing, pretty much full time now, you know, after my nine to fiver, I would drive for Uber and Lyft to help make and me. If somebody, if some people can't have access to that, because that's our younger generation who would be hurt more for that, you know, with Instagram or Facebook or Uber or Lyft. That's why we need to keep net neutrality. And, you know, I and um, the gentleman who I was talking about, Brandon, we called upon our governor back in April to sign an executive order and say, nope, we're going to stick with the with the Obama administration and keeping that neutrality for our state to protect small businesses and consumers. He never enacted it, never heard anything about it. So that, you know, it's just, it's not great. It's not great for North Dakota. It's not great for the country. We need to, we need to have that neutrality. Back. If our listeners would like to support your campaign in these final weeks, how can they do that? You can find me online. Um, you can go to my website. It's Tim Hoy, H O Y E, 4 N D. So again, Tim Hoy, 4 N D, and that's T I M H O Y E, F O R N D dot com. I have a link to my Facebook page on there as well. Okay, great. We'll put a link to your website up on our website as well. So, Tim, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we're, we're excited about your campaign, and we'll be watching on November 6th. Perfect. Thank you guys for, very much for having me this evening. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. 
Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.